going on. And I would like to what say science that. programming needed in the 50s was an eccentric looking boffin type who had lots of passion, lots of knowledge, and a sense of fun about space. No, too old, too young, too flippant, too boring. Oh, ooh, hang on, go back. No, go back. Mm, yeah, uh, ah, that's the fella. In 1957, they found him, Patrick Moore. Because all the indications are that the Russians are now making such immense progress that almost anything may happen at any moment. And I, for one, am very anxious to see what it is. He was the first person to permanently pilot a non-fiction astronomy series on TV. George, what do you think of the prospects now at the moment? I think we're nearly totally obscured, Patrick. He pointed his telescope towards TV's longest-running solo man show in any genre, The Sky at Night. Obviously, Patrick Moore was the reason why I was so successful. Uh, and he had this um, blazing enthusiasm which came right through the, your television set. When I was young, I, I loved Patrick Moore. And one of my real thrills when I started work for the B BBC was when I got to meet Patrick Moore. Within 1,600 million miles of us. Moore is, in fact, an amateur astronomer, but he showed that passion and enthusiasm could achieve more than knowledge. Plus, a bit of English eccentricity helps. It's P.G. Woodhouse in space. I believed that Patrick Moore, when he wasn't on the telly doing Sky at Night, was looking at the stars, you know, for every other moment. And then, when it was two lights, you know, uh, you know, to be looking at the stars, that he would be reading every available book on them. Now we can see the diamond ring will be appearing in a minute. We've got all the, there's the diamond ring. An incredible sight. I've always been just myself on television. Um, I've never cultivated anything. To go on, just talk as I, always, as I always do. There it is, the wing has appeared, the corona's vanished, and that is the end of this eclipse of the century. And by Jove, was it worth seeing? The idea was put it on the air once every four weeks for three months, see how it went. Well, that was 53 years ago, and we're still going. Do you think it's any good turning on to the direct general direction of the moon? Frankly, I don't think it is. I can't no. see a single star at the moment. It's totally obscured. In those early days, everything was live and things could go wrong. I remember once we went down to see George Hole's telescope for the first time, we began to show Saturn and Jupiter live through a telescope. And five minutes before the program, and five minutes after, the sky was clear. There is definitely a lightning over there now, George. Can you see it? It's coming out. Yes, there is the moon. I can see it for the moment. No, it's gone again. It's gone. In a way, the sky at night was Britain's small contribution to the post-war space race. A much cheaper budget, and we didn't have to start with dogs or monkeys. We had Patrick Moore right from the start. So sky at night got a huge boost when it started, because of when it started. 1957, it was before Sputnik. You know, if I'd come on the air in 1957, when we did the first of these sky at night programmes, and said that within five years, I'd be showing you pictures of the first man to go round the Earth in orbit in a spaceship, well, I think you'd have regarded me as mad. The show has racked up nearly a 1,000 episodes. The look has changed over that time. Well, more has changed its ties occasionally. I think Sky at Night works and has a sort of unique place in the ecology of television because it's one of the few programmes that still has space to sit a scientist down and say, OK, what's new? Tell us tell us what you're excited by and so we get these stories patrick moore's program reflected the optimism of the space race you're one of the very very few people i think whose opinion on this is really worth having in fact there are only four of you do you think from your knowledge of the moon having been there that it is going to be possible in the foreseeable future to set up scientific bases there on anything like a large scale oh i'm quite certain that we'll have such bases uh, in our lifetime Yes, Cold War rockets could have nuclear warheads on them, but they could also carry people to the moon. Hopefully not the ones with nuclear warheads. <laughs>